So if we have a unit, brand new unit, it'll have a fixed orifice, or if it's a system that we had to do major repairs, we can take that fixed orifice out and we can get a TXV that matches from the manufacturer. And if we get a match set, it slides in together and it simply threads just like so. And then on the other side, this fitting is made to match and we thread it in just like so. So we're gonna have this tube that's gonna to hook to the suction line to read the suction pressure. It's also called an equalization tube. And then we have our sensing bowl that's gonna mount in the suction line as well. And this is called our transmission tube. When we do that, we wanna make sure that these tubes don't rub against something else because you'll rub a hole in these tubes. If I rub a hole in this tube, I'll lose the refrigerant charge from the whole system. If I rub a hole in this tube, I'll lose the refrigerant charge just between the sensing bulb and this power head. Also, if we notice when we put these fittings together, there's a type of Teflon O-ring or seal. We gotta make sure that seal is present and that we don't overheat that seal. We take a look at our suction side. We have a few things to look at. One, we have our equalization tube. A lot of manufacturers leave us this nice threaded port we can put it in. Sometimes we have to braze in our own threaded port just to be able to hook that up at. It's really nice when they leave us that port, we can simply thread it together and life is good. We also wanna make sure this equalization tube is past. Remember flowing refrigerants going this way, that it's past where a sensing bulb is. And if we look at our sensing bulb, we have a few important factors of this as well. One factor is we gotta think about this clamp. It needs to be securely clamped to this suction pipe. And this clamp is made of copper. A lot of times you'll see two, two connections gonna give us a better fitting but you'll see a lot of times that it's copper and the reason it's copper is gonna be important. If we use some other kind of metal, we end up with dissimilar metals and dissimilar metals can cause corrosion and that can eat away at our sensing bulb or a copper piping. So having a copper strap helps prevent that dissimilar metals, it helps prevent electrolysis and it helps us last longer. Here's another example of that copper strap that's uh, of an old one we've took apart. Now, when you're mounting the sensing bulb, you wanna follow your manufacturer's instructions. All the TXVs will come with a little pamphlet, RTFM, read the fabulous manual, and it's gonna tell you how they want it mounted. Now, typically when you're mounting it upright, you wanna make sure these tubes here are gonna be at the top. There's gonna be liquid refrigerant inside of this sensing bulb. That's gonna be a saturated mixture. So you want the vapor at the top. You want the vapor pressure pushing towards that power head. You don't wanna drain the liquid out. Another thing is some will say if they want this transmission tube closer to the tubing or farther away. If it was like this, you would want this transmission tube at the top. And this is what we could simply call the tail and the tails where they charge it from the factory. You'd want this down at the bottom. So if the transmission tube is down here at the bottom, we end up with an issue of we could get liquid refrigerant coming out of that and it wouldn't be working exactly like it's designed. So uh, another point of view is how it's mounted. Most manufacturers do not, if it's horizontal, they do not want it at the very top or the very bottom. The very top, it could read too much superheat. And at the very bottom, it potentially can read uh, the oil temperature, not a true suction port. Most of them want it at 10 and two, meaning at, if it was a clock, we'd have the two o'clock location. If it was a clock over here, it'd be the 10 o'clock location. And some manufacturers want them over here in this location, which would be like seven and eight, or they would want it at four and five. So you gotta read the manufacturer specifications. So it's usually either here and here, or it will be here and here. And I've seen some manufacturers say, if your pipe is uh, greater than seven eighths, do it one way. If it's less than seven eighths, do it another way. So follow those manufacturer's instructions. And those manufacturer's instructions always override anything I say anyway. So manufacturer's instructions are gonna be important. So let's move that out of the way. A few different types of TXVs that we have. There's many different types. We're just gonna go into a few of them just to give you a little better view. Here we have these two are the same fitting, the same manufacturer, but they're a little different. This one's a non-adjustable TXV, whereas this one is fully adjustable. Do not adjust this valve until you know how and are fully ready to do so. And you've eliminated all the other possibilities, such as is the sensing bulb mounted correctly? Is there proper airflow across the evaporator coil? Are you feeding it enough subcooled liquid? Is there enough of a heat load? These are the things that are outside of a TXV's control. And if you're working in refrigeration, you wanna make sure your box temperature is down within range first. But let's say that we need to increase the superheat. Let's say my superheat's too low, I'm flooding my evaporator. Since this one's adjustable, we can adjust it. What we're gonna use is our service wrench. What I can do is put this tool on and it fits. This square hole fits the square peg here. 
And by screwing this in a clockwise location, as the clock turns, turn it a quarter to a half turn. There's a disagreement over which is best. I like small increments, but I've turned it a half of a turn clockwise. In other words, pushing it in, that's going to then increase our superheat. It's gonna give us higher superheat. My evaporator flooded, my superheat's too low. I would turn it clockwise to increase superheat. On another scenario, let's say that all of my conditions are good. I got enough subcooling come in. My sensing bulb was mounted properly. I had good airflow, clean coil. All the other stuff is good. And my superheat's too high. Let's say if my superheat's at 30 and I would need it much lower than that. We then go counterclockwise. I'm gonna turn it this direction. I'm gonna back it off. And by backing it off, this is going to allow the TXV to decrease superheat. It's gonna to try to maintain superheat at a lower number. And ideally we want between eight and 18, depending on what you're working with. It's not a set in stone number. So that's how we can adjust it. Again, don't be adjusting TXVs until you've read more about it, until we've gone more about it and you know what you need to know about them. But this is an adjustable TXV and I do like adjustable TXVs. They, uh, they are my pleasure. And again, these connections, you wanna make sure you use a type of wrench or an adjustable wrench, but never pliers because it's made of brass. If you use pliers, it can egg this brass. It can also it'll mar these ends and just it's a good habit to use the proper tool for those connections. So non-adjustable and fully adjustable. So let's take a look at a little bit more details about this. This one is a threaded fitting, so it helps protect this TXV, but there's others that are braze connections. For example, here is a braze connection. So if we pull these plugs, we're gonna have to braze this fitting. Now when we do that, we're gonna have to protect the TXV. We wanna keep it below 212 degrees. So we're gonna put wet rags on it. Not just damp rags, but wet rags, or we put heat absorbing paste. I've seen some guys use heat absorbing paste just really thin, you wanna like coat this whole entire thing where it's a gum of heat absorbing paste. And you're gonna have to use an excessive amount of heat over here because the heat absorbing paste is gonna take the heat away from your braze. So then you're gonna have to braze it very quickly all the way across. They also make a type of chalk. You can put this chalk on here and the chalk will change colors if it gets too hot. So you can check the valve. But a big problem with these valves is people when they're brazing, they overheat the valve and they damage the components inside. Also, where the sensing bulb is located on the suction side, they'll braze it. And as the temperature increases on the line, the temperature in the bulb increases, the pressure increases, and it damages the power head inside of here. So temperature is one of the main ways these valves get damaged. The other way these valves get damaged is not having enough airflow. People replace the valves all the time when the problem is the evaporator coil. Dirty evaporator coil, blocked airflow, not enough airflow, low load conditions, or they don't have enough refrigerant coming to it. Maybe a clogged filter dryer, maybe their subcooling's too low. They don't get enough refrigerant to it and they condemn this poor guy when there was nothing wrong with him in the first place. Let's look inside and see what's happening. Here's a removable power head where this one is fixed. It's non-serviceable power head. This one is a replaceable. We can change it out to different styles and different sizes. But this is our sensing bulb on the suction line. So as the suction line temperature increases, the pressure inside the bulb increases and it puts more pressure on the power head. So right now there's refrigerant trapped inside of this system, separate from the whole entire unit. It's its own sealed system. And right here, this is the piece that's gonna be moving. This pushes back and forth depending on the pressure. Now it's also important to note that this sensing bulb needs to be securely mounted to the suction line and it needs to be insulated to the suction line. They make a type of insulation that I like. It has its uh, self-sticking insulation. You wrap it around, but you still put a cable tie on it because it comes loose. They also make this type of insulation. I don't know the proper name. I call it asphalt insulation because it's sticky like asphalt and it makes a horrible gooey mess, please. Please, I beg you, do not use this material ever for anything, especially for sensing bulbs, because the goo gets down between the sensing bulb and the line and doesn't make good contact, and it makes a horrible mess. It gets all over your hands, it gets everywhere. It's just a mess. I call it asphalt insulation also because it's a pain in the asphalt. So try to stay away from that, please, for my sake, uh, for anybody working on it. I see a lot of installers that like to use it because they never have to go back and work on it. But it's its own refrigerant inside of here. Here, I've cut a sensing bulb open so you can see what's inside. Now I've seen pictures before where sometimes manufacturers will put something inside of here to help keep the liquid in the bulb, but this one is just incredibly simply hollow. And when I did cut this open, refrigerant came out of this. So it's very simple little process. Here we can see our power head where that pressure pushes into this very top plate and that pushes back and forth. Let's take a closer look at that power head. 
See, this is the part that's going to move. There's a little plate right here. This is the part that's going to move. There's a little plate right here. But on this side, you can see the cut open section. This is the plate that's going to move. And it barely moves. It doesn't move very far, like fraction. It gets a decimal of an inch, very small amount. The power head comes into here. And right here, there's two separate pieces of metal. So the refrigerant's going to fill this side. And as the temperature of the sensing bulb over here goes up, the pressure goes up, and it pushes and fills this void and pushes this plate downward. And then as the temperature of that drops, it allows the pressure to reduce and the spring and suction pressure help push that back open. So it doesn't move very much. There's very little movement that it has in there, but overall it makes a huge difference in how big that hole opens and closes. This is the power head. It's what it looks like inside. Let's look at the valve now. So our power head would be mounted something like this. Here's the inside of our thermostatic expansion valve. Refrigerant's flowing in this direction. It's coming into the side. This is our liquid side. And then it goes through this opening right here where you see that pin. This is what that pin is what's going to be moving. It's going to be opening or closing. If you can see that this chamber is a little bit of a cone shape. So this pin opens and closes that makes the hole, the opening in here, increase or decrease. So the refrigerant goes through the metering device. Then here is flash gas. It's going to boil immediately from a liquid to a vapor. So we have saturation going to our distribution tube to our evaporator. So refrigerant goes down through here and out the other side. So that power head, the temperature that, and the pressure on that power head pushes down on this pin and pushes against the spring to overcome it. But that's not the only force that we're dealing with. We're also dealing with the suction pressure. Remember that equalization tube pushes into this chamber. So let's take the power head off and see what we have underneath. So here, this is where that tube comes in. This is our equalization tube. This is our suction pressure. Suction pressure comes in and see that little hole right there, that little orifice? That hole is drilled to where it interacts and pushes against, right here, against this power head. So it's interesting to think there's two things working against each other. So we have the sensing bulb and the pressure in the sensing bulb related to the temperature trying to push this power head towards us. And then we have this hole right here that's pushing back against it. So it's not just simply the suction line temperature. It's not just simply the suction pressure. It's two working together. So as they work together, that's gonna to be superheat. Plus we have another force, which is called our spring force right here. So the spring force is gonna be pushing back against this power head also. So they're all working together. Now this one's not adjustable. Here in a minute we'll look at an adjustable one where we can change the spring tension pushing back and we can adjust our superheat. But it's pretty simple how it works overall. The suction pressure and the actual suction line temperature are pushing against each other to decide how much force that we need to cause this pin to open or close. And I'll pull this pin out of the way. When I cut this open, the saw kind of damaged some of these moving parts. So it's we're talking about brass fittings right here, and then this pin is a steel pin. So that pin is what's moving. So if we were to get this too hot, say brazing or installing it, we have a few things that can be damaged. One is we can warp this pin. Number two is where this pin fits through, there's a rubber gasket right here, this rubber seal. So this rubber seal is keeping the refrigerant on the high side and everything else separate from what's happening on this power head. So if we get this too hot, we're gonna melt this rubber seal and allow high pressure to be able to come up into this side and affect the TXV. So it's one of the big problems, they get these too hot when they're working on them. Also, if you're getting it too hot, you can damage the refrigerant here. And if you're brazing on that suction side and you leave this, too much pressure causes it to overpressure in this diaphragm right here and damage that as well. Also, if you get these hot, heat can affect spring tension. So if I get this valve too hot while I'm brazing it, I can damage the spring on top of that. So there's a lot of things that can be damaged simply from heat alone. Let's look at another thing that can cause damage, and that would be contaminants. So if we, if we let contaminants get in, say dirt in the pipe while we're working with it, or let's say that uh, we didn't run nitrogen through while we were brazing, that oxidation is going to get up in here, and that oxidation is going to clog up this pin and this moving action. This pin is very simple. It just slides right down inside of here. And I am missing, there should be another plate right here that I'm missing. But that pin just slides up and down, up and down. And remember there's oil with the refrigerant so that pin stays lubricated. So it just opens and closes ever so slightly. Just barely moves as it needs. Now this particular model has something different. Here we see this little chamber. This chamber is a check valve. 
Later we're going to talk about heat pumps and heat pumps need to bypass one of the metering devices. So if refrigerant's flowing this way through the suction side, I get high pressure pushing this way, it's going to push this check valve open and allow refrigerant to continue on bypassing this pin. So it allows for an internal check valve. Now when refrigerant flows this way, it pushes the little ball closed and refrigerant can't flow down. It can only go through our metering pin. So I lost the ball out when I was cutting it open. I wasn't able to save it, unfortunately, but that's just a little check valve. It just simply opens and closes. So refrigerant swung this way, it opens, bypasses, refrigerant flows this way, and it closes. It's an internal check valve. You can get these TXTs with or without them. Here we have this model, which is the same thing. This has an external check valve. So when refrigerant's flowing this direction, this check valve is closed and the refrigerant has to be metered through our TXV and then onto our evaporator coil. But if refrigerant's going this direction, it goes through and pushes this check valve open. The refrigerant bypasses the TXV altogether and continues its flow the other way. So if it's going this way, the refrigerant liquid refrigerant continues to flow. If it's going this way, liquid refrigerant has this valve closes and it has to go through this TXV. This is an external check valve and this one is an internal check valve. So this is a basic, uh, simple style, uh, removable power head here. Nothing too complicated. So let's take a look at this commercial model. It's very similar, just has a little bit different piping on it. This one's designed for a flare fitting. But we'll take our little cover off so we can see what's happening inside. And one of the first things that we see is right here. This is a screen. It's a type of protector for the system. So this screen is really important because it helps filter the refrigerant before it comes in. So let's take a closer look at that. Here you can see on the very end of the screen, a discoloration. So this got definitely got dirty. There's contaminants that came through and this filter caught it. It collected it here before it completely blocked it, but it is a little dirty. Over here, it's not as bad, but these screens can a lot of times be cleaned. You can soak this in alcohol or an RX-11 flush and you can clean this up. I mean, sometimes they, they're just too bad and you have to replace them. But this is a fully replaceable screen. You can take the refrigerant out of the system. You can undo this connection. You can take this screen out, clean it, replace it, put the screen back in. So it's filtering that refrigerant and helping protect the moving parts of the metering device. Here, our power head works the same way. We have the diaphragm inside of here. So on the very, very top side is where refrigerant's going to be just in the power head alone, only in its transmission tube. And then that's pushing down against this plate. This plate pushes down against the pin, against the spring. We also have that same rubber seal right here. And also we have the external equalization port. This is measuring the suction pressure past the evaporator coil. And it's going through a tube into that chamber. And that tube is right here that goes up. And so this tube is pushing against that power head as well as the spring is also pushing against the power head. So this is what we call external equalized. Some TXVs have an internal equalized, which means this port right here is connected to where it's pushing against it. External is usually better because there is a possibility to have a slight pressure drop through the evaporator coil. So we're getting a true temperature of our superheat at the exit of that evaporator coil. So it's taking account our actual suction line temperature and our suction PSIG converted temperature saturated so that we can get true superheat exiting that evaporator coil. But in smaller evaporators, you'll see an internally equalized where this port won't be here, but it's still there. It's just inside. They would simply have this tube connected. So the suction pressure here would be pushing against the power head. So very simple in how it works. What's cool about this though, is this one, we can adjust it. Here, I can change the spring tension. If I screw this clockwise, in other words, screw this pin where it's going up clockwise location, I'm increasing the spring tension. And what that does is increase my superheat. And if I turn this in a counterclockwise location, I'm decreasing spring tension and that decreases my superheat. So by adjusting this, I can control the superheat. Now, again, I got to stress, I can't stress it enough is that we got to make sure we have enough liquid refrigerant feeding this first. We also have to make sure we have enough airflow across our evaporator coil. We have to make sure that our sensing bulb is mounted properly and that we're working within a, a reasonable range. If I have a high load in that evaporator coil, it's not going to matter. If I don't have my TXV, at least down into the, the general operating temperature, it's not going to do any good to adjust it. As you can see here, the spring can be affected by the heat, as well as this ring here can be affected by heat. The pin can be affected by heat. And also this uh, power head can be affected by the heat as well as the sensing bulb. So we make sure when we're brazing this kid together, we don't get this valve too hot. Notoriously, people get this valve overheated, get it too hot, and that's a big cause of fail. And also not brazing with nitrogen. 
This model gives us this cool screen, but if this screen clogs up, well, that's going to issue, be an issue. It's going to be a restriction. This was condemned and there was nothing wrong with this valve. When I opened it up, I found contaminants inside. I found trash inside. This was sitting over here in the spring area. So when they soft soldered this connection, they left this trash in and this blew through the system and it got hung up in the spring and it wouldn't adjust. Now we were in a hurry, so we ended up changing out the TXV, but had we simply taken this TXV apart to clean it out, we would have seen that that was the issue and we could have saved a trip to the supply house. But this TXV had nothing wrong with it until I took it apart anyways. So this is an adjustable TXV. Let's take a look at another TXV. So this TXV right here was also failed and we can see that this had a soft solder connection. And here, how you can see the soft solder pulled on the side, they pulled the soft solder too far in. And here you had a blob of soft solder here as well. So again, they were in a hurry to replace this. Uh, they gave me the old one. We also have an external equalizer tube. This has a replaceable power head. Sometimes these power head, the transmission tube will be rubbing and that will cause a leak in the refrigerant in just a power head. So this can be replaced. Here we have our, uh, where the external equalizer port comes in. The temperature of our suction line affects how much this is pushing down and the suction pressure is affecting pushing it back against that. So there's two forces working there as well as a spring force. That pushes against the pin. If we take this off, we see that it's fully adjustable. What I love, this is my favorite valve body, is because when we take this piece out, or we have a screen right here. I love that, it's so easy to work with. But let's take a look real quick at what we have here. This is the screen, just like we took apart with this screen. Notice how these screens look significantly different. This one is already dirty, but let's take a look at this screen. This screen is absolutely disgusting. This is horrible. So this screen is completely full of trash. It is just completely clogged up. What's even worse is right here, we see all of this gum-like material. Well, this is flux. When they were soft soldering this connection, anytime you soft solder, you have to use a flux that etches away. Now flux is an acid and that acid eats away all any of the oxidation of the copper so that the soft solder can get a good connection. In this case, they put too much flux and they actually got flux all the way inside of this tube right here and it filled up and clogged completely all of this entire screen is clogged up because of the flux. They really fluxed this unit up and it caused significant damage. On top of that, flux is an acid. That acid is eating away at not just this component and this component, but everywhere inside that refrigeration cycle. It's completely gummed up all the way through here. So I love that how they have this screen accessible. You still have to take all the refrigerant out of the system because that's liquid, straight liquid to be shooting out of there. But when we further investigated and take this piece apart, this is our spring. This is where it's adjustable. So we can see here, this is our adjustment fitting and it's putting, adding or decreasing pressure against the spring. But this spring right here is rusted up really bad. Let's pull this spring out, take a closer look at it. And here we can see the bottom side of the spring is all shiny and clean where it was shoved down inside of this fitting here. And the top part of this is rusted up and it also has that flux on it. That acid has been eating away on the spring. Then as we take this plate here off, we can see there's all kinds of discoloration and that green stuff all in there. This is from also that flux. It absolutely did a ton of damage on that spring. Look at that, look at all of this discoloration. It's just hor horrifically, horrifically sad seeing this beautiful TXV all clogged up with that flux. But when it gets worse, if we look inside of this valve body, we see some foreign material in there. For one, we see all that green in the bottom. Well, all that green is from the flux too, but right here, we see a little piece that's moving around. What is that? That should be moving around. So let's open this up. We'll drop this out. And here, right here, this is a piece of soft solder. This soft solder clogged up this TXV. Now, just so you don't think that this was the same soft solder blob that clogged the last one up, here was the last one. So there are two separate soft solder blogs right there, blobs, blog, blob, whatever, uh, that clogged up this TXV. So this TXV failed. Here's two failed TXVs that had nothing to do with the TXV. It had to do with how they were serviced. Here they use soft solder, so there's no oxidation issue, but the soft solder itself clogged it up and the acid from the flux clogged up and ate away the system. So it's horrible. Now this can still be saved. I can clean all this up. I can put it in a bath and clean it all out and put it back together. But sometimes it's just, you know, simpler just to replace it. But this TXV was murdered. It wasn't, it didn't just die. Somebody killed it a nice slow paint. They poisoned it to death. 
poor TXV. So when you're thinking about these TXVs and they're failing, are they really failing or was something to them? Were they not protected? Were they not serviced correctly? Were they not taken care of? Uh, when they used flare fittings, did they use the proper flare? Was it leaking? You know, did they have the correct size pipe on it? The flare side, this flare end right here should very firmly connect against the copper itself. This copper makes that flare. So a lot of times these flares will leak. If they were brazing, did they run nitrogen through? The oxidation will clog all these moving parts up. Both of these were clean. There's no oxidation because they use soft solder, but they also died because of the same soft solder death. This one died because of the flux acid. This one didn't have anything wrong with it. it just had that blog of, uh, of soft solder clogging it up. And uh, this one also didn't have anything wrong with it as well, other than the power head had broken off right here. To, you can see that brake mark. So we could just simply replace the power head on this one. It would have been good. Uh, not now because it's completely destroyed it. But you can see how simple they are. There's not a whole lot to these uh, TXVs. They work by opening and closing. And they open and close a percent of what it would be with a fixed orifice. So here we have a fixed orifice. And if you were to calculate the size of this hole, a TXV can open so much percent greater than this hole, or it can close so much percent smaller than this hole. And I've some cases seen the TXV completely close up entirely. Now there's a whole lot more to learn with TXVs. This is still just part two of an introductory. This gives you a little bit better look at what's happening inside this TXV, but uh, overall it's real simple. Superheat affects the pin as well as the spring pressure, we can adjust it. They're usually killed by contaminants or heat. Very simple parts. A lot of people have heard of the Adele's Refrigeration Air Conditioning Guide. This is their Modern Air Conditioning Refrigeration 2nd Edition. This was actually by Mr. Willis H. Carrier himself, uh, as well as some other people uh, from the Carrier Corporation. It was copyrighted in 1940. And here we have our beautiful thermostatic expansion valve. We got our sensing bulb, transmission tube, power head. Um, here we have our, looks like that one might be an internally equalized. If we push against the pin, here we have our spring, a little bit different design, but it's still adjustable. Uh, here we have our filter where it comes in, our liquid line comes in, has to go through the metering pin before it continues on out. So very simple, same design as we use now. And this has uh, been around. And if you take care of them, service them, treat them good, they will last a long time. I've seen TXVs, 40 years old and old equipment still working fantastic. So uh, really dependable product, dependable piece. It's cool, this one's from the Sporlin Valve Company. So I guess Portland's been around for a long time.